Greetings on this very warm Labor Day weekend. Before we get into service, I've got a couple of announcements for you. The first is that in observance of Labor Day, the office will be closed on Monday the 7th. Second, Resurrection is collecting shoes for the Stephen Center through the 12th of September as we participate in their One Day Without Shoes initiative. So if you have some shoes that are gently worn or even new that you'd like to donate, bring them to the church. There is a box set up in the cafe where you can drop them off. Uh, they'll thank you. Rally Sunday is coming up next week. Uh, join us for the 5.30 service on Saturday evening and the 10 a.m. drive-in service on Sunday morning. Worship will be followed by a church picnic from 11 to 12.30. Our kids are invited to pick up a Sunday school workbook to do with their families at home. And a backpack tag in preparation for the first day of Sunday school, which will be on September 20th. Next Sunday is also God's Work, Our Hands. We have two missions going on that day. We have casseroles that can be dropped off at the church kitchen after service for the meal train. Uh, we also have donations that can be made to the least of my brethren. Uh, further information on both of these missions can be found in the bulletin for this service, but it can also be found in your September messenger. So I do invite you to go and check those things out. And finally, for announcements, we have uh, Table Grace Ministries food truck coming to the church on September 27th from 5.30 to 7.30. This is a thriving action plan uh, that we are doing to bring the truck here, but this is a fundraiser for Table Grace. As you may or may not know, Table Grace is a ministry in downtown Omaha that services food insecure and homeless people downtown. Uh, they have been hit hard. The revenue streams have changed because of the pandemic, and so we are going to help them out. We're going to bring them out. Simone is going to play for us, and it will be an opportunity for us within social distancing uh, to have a fellowship event and get caught up with our friends and brothers and sisters in Christ. So please join us on September 27th from 5.30 to 7.30 for Table Grace Food Truck. Now, beyond these announcements, I would just like to take a minute to thank you for your ongoing support for the work of Christ here at Resurrection. And if you have the ability but haven't done so yet, I'd encourage you to follow the link in the description of this video, which will take you to the church's homepage. Scroll down to the bottom, and you'll find all the information you need for online giving. Thank you so much. Now, at this time, let us continue by preparing our hearts and minds for worship with our opening song, Day of Arising. Thank you. 
Let us continue with the prayer of the day. O Lord God, enliven and preserve your church with your perpetual mercy. Without your help, we mortals would fail. Remove far from us everything that is harmful and lead us toward all that gives life and salvation through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes to us from the prophet Ezekiel, beginning in the 33rd chapter. So you mortal, I have made a sentinel for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked ones, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, but their blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from their ways, and they do not turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, but you shall save your life. Now you mortals say to the house of Israel, thus you have said, our transgressions and our sins weigh upon us, and we waste away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their ways and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for you. why will you die, O house of Israel? Second reading this morning is from Paul's letter to the Romans, beginning in the 13th chapter. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to the neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the work of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery or licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousness. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desire. Our Holy Gospel comes from St. Matthew, beginning from the 18th chapter. Jesus says, If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If a member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the witness of two or three witnesses. If a member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Here end our readings. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I was asked once if pastors ever lie. My immediate response was, only at funerals. A case study of this are the two brothers that lived a wicked life. They were businessmen and they cheated everyone they came into contact with, and yet despite the way they conducted themselves in the world, they became very wealthy. But when one of the brothers died, the surviving brother went to the pastor, the local pastor, and said, Pastor, I'll tell you what, if you preside over my brother's funeral and you say some nice things about him, then I will give your church $20,000. If you don't do this, then I'll just go to another church and they'll take my money. Well, the pastor had been cheated by these very brothers in the past. 
And he had 20 grand, just 20 grand. And so he said, yes, I will do it. And at the day of the funeral, the pastor told the truth. He talked about the kind of life that the deceased brother had lived, about the wicked and evil things that he had done, about the practices that he engaged in, about putting himself before those, the needs of his neighbors and his friends. And he said that the only hope that he had was that the grace of God would bring salvation to him against the wicked life that he had lived. And as the pastor related all of these things, he could see in the corner of his eye the brother, the surviving brother, just getting angrier and angrier, seething in his seat. But finally the pastor said, and yet, despite all the wicked things that this person had done in their life, I can say this in their favor. At least they weren't as bad as his brother. Yes, pastors lie. Hopefully not very often and not about anything big, but pastors are human and as such are prone to err in the same way that all Christians are prone to err. And this fact shouldn't surprise anyone, and yet it does. There was a woman who was a great evangelist. She could invite, and she didn't care, she'd invite a tree to worship if she had five seconds to spend with it. But one person that she invited to worship didn't want to go. He was very vocal about it, didn't have any polite bone in his body, and said, no, I'm not going to your church because they're full of a bunch of hypocrites. And the evangelist said to the person, well, it's not full of hypocrites. There's room for one more. You know, it's bad enough. It's bad enough when the outside world looks at the body of Christ and sees its worst parts. It sees the sin that we commit, either by the things that we do or by the things that we fail to do. And this is especially damning to the church when those looking in don't have an understanding about our two natures, that we're 100% saints in Christ, but at the same time, we're 100% sinners. It's worse, though, than someone looking in without that understanding when Christians think the same way who should know better. When Christians become surprised when their brothers and sisters in Christ sin. Think about any conflict that you've ever experienced in the church. What's one of the things that always gets said? This is the church. It shouldn't be this way. And yes, we should be able to have disagreements without becoming disagreeable, but the church is made up of people. Broken. Sinful. People. People who bring all the frustrations of this world with them when they come to worship or when they come to do the work of God. People who will at times put their own desires ahead of the community of Christ. Now this doesn't make them hypocrites because we have the two natures we understand and we recognize our sin. What it does make us is people who fall short of the glory of God. And it shouldn't surprise anyone that times arise when we all behave in ways that are unhealthy. In fact, this reality gives us expressions like this that I've heard more than once when pastors get together and talk about their congregations. It goes like this. Well, in our church is only one or two funerals away from being healthy. While sin in the body of Christ may surprise and shock us or cause those from the outside to view the church as full of hypocrites, it does not surprise Jesus. In fact, we hear in our lesson today the framework that Jesus gives us as a way to resolve the conflict that inevitably arises when a bunch of people are put into the same group, put into the same space. 
And the church has been using the reading from today to resolve conflict for millennia. And this model calls for resolution to happen within an ever-expanding framework of witnesses. But it always begins with the two people who are in conflict coming together to talk about what is wrong. And if that doesn't work out, then one witness or two witnesses are brought in and so forth and so on until it's the entire congregation. And if that doesn't work to resolve the conflict, well, then the person at fault is cast out of the conflict because Jesus says, treat them like a tax collector or a Gentile. Basically, it's saying, treat them as if they don't belong. Now, in my experience, this model for conflict resolution tends to work better in the South than it does in the Midwest. Southerners are a little more open about their feelings than we are here. And in the Midwest, in my experience, you're a little more passive aggressive. Instead of talking through an issue and getting more people involved, if that issue doesn't get resolved, y'all tend to just stop talking about the issue at least to one another. You'll go outside and you'll talk about it in the periphery, uh, but you're certainly not going to talk about it with the people you're in conflict with. But this too shouldn't surprise us um, wherever we are that we can't get together and talk about it um, in the parties that are conflicted. Why? Well, because we are sinners. And yet, this text from Matthew 18 remains, this model remains, and if we could keep in mind that there is something of divine in this model, then maybe we'd be more willing to use it. Jesus reminds us today that where two or three are gathered in his name, he is present. Now, oftentimes when we hear that, we think about stuff like, well, devotions or in Bible studies, or worship, or accounts, or committee meetings, or we go together for mission works, we don't often think about it in terms of conflict resolution, but where two or more are gathered, even when they're in conflict with one another, in Christ's name, there Christ is present. And if Christ is present, then it has this implication for us on how we are to act toward one another. Because we see in the person we are upset with, if we're gathered in Christ's name, we see in that other person the face of Christ. The face of the one who loved us enough to go to the cross. And in those moments, we have the person in our presence who did everything they could to restore our relationship with God. And if both the people in conflict view one another like that, then that conflict will get resolved. But if they can't, if they can't view one another like that, then they get a couple of witnesses involved to get that relationship restored. The brothers and sisters in the church, they're brought in to bear the presence of Christ, which they no longer can to make that resolution happen. And if that doesn't work, then the party at fault is treated like the outsider. But even if they're kicked out of the community, we still have the example of Christ. And what did Jesus do with people who were on the outside? What did Jesus do with sinners and tax collectors? Well, he went out to them to bring them back into relationship. Our text today has everything to do with restoring relationships that have been damaged by sin. And if our Lord spends so much effort talking to us about how to deal effectively with conflict, then we shouldn't be surprised when conflict arises. But neither should we be idle. Or let things fester until it becomes unhealthy, whether it's in our congregation or whether it's in our home or whether it's in our work or wherever that conflict may exist. 
my dear friends in Christ, if there's some relationship in your life that's breaking down, that is conflicted, then for the love of God, go in the name of Jesus to meet with that person to try to resolve it. And if both of you are there and you both have the presence of Christ, then you're going to find Jesus in that meeting. Christ will be there. Amen. You may want to think about that as you gather together with family over the Labor Day weekend and talk about politics. Amen. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Unite your church, O God. Grant us the gifts of repentance and reconciliation. Bless the cooperative work of churches in this community. Strengthen ecumenical partners. Guide the work of the Lutheran World Federation and the World Council of Churches. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Protect your creation, O God. Teach us ways that do not harm what you have entrusted to our care. Renew and enliven places suffering from drought, flood, storms, or pollution. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Turn nations and leaders from ways that lead to death. Shape new paths toward peace and cooperation, teaching us to recognize one another as neighbors. Guide legislatures, civil servants, judges, and police toward laws that protect the well-being of all. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Tend to all in need of your compassion. Hear the cries of those awaiting justice and those yearning for forgiveness. Give community to the lonely and neighbors to, to the outcast. Shelter all who are vulnerable in body, mind, or spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sustain us in our work, O God, and give work to those who need it. Shape societies to ensure fair treatment for all who labor. Help us to love our neighbors in and through our work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember with thanksgiving those who have died in faith. As you equip them, equip us with your protection and power until with them we see your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things. And whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We reflect upon the word we have received this morning with our sending song, The Beautiful Name It Is.
receive our final blessing. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. May God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the, the Comforter bless you and keep you in love, in eternal love. Amen. My dear friends in Christ, as you go forth into this Labor Day weekend, do so and share God's word, show God's love, serve God. Amen. Alleluia.
Oh 